listening to episode 37 of the Abyssid History Podcast, an audio platform to examine pre modern Islamic, Islamic history, and a global medieval past. And our second installment of a 12 part series entitled A Spring of Classical Arabic Poetry with Dr. Kevin Blankenship at Brigham Young University in Utah. Part 11 Sophie ad Din al Hilli, 1278 to 1349, Komunira. A celebrated poet of Mamluk times. We are sponsored by IHRC Bookshops. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at checkout terms and conditions apply. Contact IHRC Bookshop for details. I'm your host, Dalha Hassan, a PhD student at the School of Orient and African Studies in London. Now on to the show. Safi ad Din al Hilli was a Shi'i poet who was born in Iraq and lived much of his life in Mardin in modern-day Turkey. To discuss with me the life, work and legacy of Sofi Ad-Din Al-Hulli is Dr. Kevin Blankenship. Welcome, Dr. Blankenship. Thanks, Talha. Good to be with you. Sofi Ad-Din Al-Hulli was born in 1278, just over a decade after the Mongol sack of Baghdad. What do we know about his socio-political context? Two political dynasties are important for understanding Safi ad-Din's life and times, the Turco-Mongol Ilhanids and the Egyptian Mamluks. The Mongol invasions of the Islamic world began in 1221 with the conquest of eastern Iran. But a more devastating wave of conquest came with Genghis Khan's grandson Hulagu when Mongol forces subjugated all of Iran and by 1258 had also taken Baghdad, which of course brought a, de- a decisive end to an already flailing Abbasid Caliphate. In establishing rule over most of West Asia, including Iraq, Iran, Khorasan, the Caucasus, and parts of Asia Minor, Hulagu assumed the title of Il Khan, meaning lesser Khan, subordinate to the great Khan ruling in China. In this branch of the Mongol dynasty, which became known as the Il Khanids, centered its power in northwest Iran. So even though... These Mongol conquests initially brought devastation and affected the balance of artistic production. In a short period of time, the control of most of Asia by the Mongols, the so-called Pax Mongolica, created an environment of great cultural exchange. Of course, this is a, a corrective narrative to earlier sort of traditional narratives about the extent of destruction and its impact in the region. Following the conversion to Islam of Ilhan Mahmud Ghazan in 1295 and the establishment of his cultural policy in supporting this new religion, Islamic art and architecture flourished once again. And of course, there's a fine tradition of Ilhanate Islamic art. The Mamluk Sultanate, which is the other dynasty that's important for understanding the life and times of Safi ad Din, emerged from the weakening of the Ayyubid realm in Egypt and Syria. Ayyubid sultans, as many listeners will know, depended on slave soldiers for military organization. And of course, the word is Mamluk, literally owned. Yet Mamluks of uh, Kipchak Turkic, Turkic origin eventually overthrew the last independent Ayyubid sultan in Egypt, Turan Shah, and they established their own rule. Then their sort of unusual political system didn't rely solely on family succession to the throne. Slaves were also recruited into the governing class hence the name of the sultanate later given by historians, the Mamluks. Following the defeat of Mongol armies at the Battle of Ain Jalut in 1260, the Mamluks inherited the last Ayyubid strongholds in the eastern Mediterranean. After a short period of time, the Mamluks created a great Islamic empire, perhaps the greatest of the later Middle Ages, including control of the city, uh, the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. And the Mamluk capital at Cairo became an economic, cultural, and artistic center of the Arab Islamic world. Mamluk history typically is divided into two periods based on different dynastic lines. The Bahari Mamluks of Kipchak, Turkish, Turkic origin from southern Russia, named after the location of their barracks on the Nile, al Bahar, literally the sea, the name, a name given to the Nile River. And the Burji Mamluks of Caucasian Circassian origin who were quartered in the citadel, El Burj, meaning tower. And after receiving instruction in Arabic, the fundamentals of Islam and the art of warfare, slaves in these royal barracks were manumitted, let free, and given responsibilities in the Mamluk hierarchy. 
It's also in this period that the traditional narrative of Arabic literary history marks the start of a long slide into decadence or in thought. And hopefully listeners are familiar with this narrative, but in fact, Arabic literature recovered from a kind of a crisis once the Ayyubids had achieved sufficient stability in Syria and Egypt, which sort of became a single political and cultural unit, broadly speaking. Um, and these all, these events all enabled the rise of a bourgeois urban culture that went on to become the bearer of a flourishing new Arabic literary culture. And so one consequential development, one consequence of this was a growing interest of religious scholars in the culture of adab, the ulama, became interested in writing poetry uh, and other kinds of literary work. So the, the process of ulamaization of adab, of literature, kind of a mirror image of a similar process of adabization of the ulama, who, as I mentioned, started writing poetry and arts prose, including such quote-unquote profane genres like satire and wine poetry. And so this was a time of mass education as well, based especially on the foundation of madrasas, even in smaller towns. And this fostered a kind of broad, literate and semi-literate middle class. And along with the ulamat, that literate and semi-literate middle class were quite interested in literature of any kind. So while the military elite of the Mamluks was only peripherally interested in Arabic literature and favored other means of representation like architecture, the bourgeois upper middle class and middle classes embraced literature for self-expression. Uh, and they were eager to have it as a kind of entertainment to find pleasure in literature, as well as to improve literary knowledge and even to gain social prestige, which again, literature served this function of sort of upping your social capital. Uh, and all of these factors together meant an uptick in broad demand for literary works. That demand led to increased production of many kinds of literature, especially anthologies. In fact, the Mamluk period has been called the golden age of the anthology. Many poets of this period didn't wait to collect their poetic output at the end of their lives in a duen, but throughout their lives would publish different selections from their works at different times, which of course met this demand among audiences along with the demands of the market. A key early work of this kind is Al-Qatr al-Nubati by Jamal al-Din ibn Nubata al-Misri, the first collection of epigrams arranged according to topic. And this book became an immediate success and was uh, followed by, was copied by, or emulated, I guess, by people like Badr al-Din ibn Habib uh, and his Shudur, and Safi al-Din himself with Diwan al-Mathalith wal-Mathani fil Ma'ali wal-Ma'ani which has been edited and published. And at the same time, texts written in sophisticated rhyme prose like maqamas, official and private letters and documents enjoyed the same or similar prestige as poetry. And so consequently, in Shet, chancery texts of this kind were also collected in the form of anthologies. War and disaster forced Al-Hilli to leave his family and move to Mardin. What do we know about his life? Safi Adin Al-Hilli was born, as his nisba suggests, was born in modern-day Iraq in 1278 at the ancient Shiite center of Hella in central Iraq. Although Safiya Din himself was apparently a moderate Shiite, he was quite happy to spend much of his career at the courts of strongly Sunni leaders, and this probably had a lot to do with necessity since Sunni Islam predominated in the parts of the Muslim world where he operated. Safiya Din left his native town in 1301 to 1302 to go to the court of the Turkmen Artuqids of Mardin under Ilkhanate rule. And the reasons for the move were, on the one hand, this atmosphere of factionalism and vendetta in Hella. Uh, Safiya Din had taken revenge for the death of one of his uncles who'd been murdered and thus was in fear for his own life. On the other hand, the Artuqid principality of Mardin was flourishing in a relatively peaceful place. And at, by this point, Safiya Din had already won some renown as a poet. And so he was warmly received by Al-Malik Al-Mansur, Najm al-Din Ghazi, and most likely wrote the Durar al-Nahur fi Mada'ih Al-Malik Al-Mansur to introduce himself to the prince. This is you know, a collection of poetry and praising this, uh, this Malik Mansur. So, because of this reception, sorry, Safiya Din became a Nadim, a boon companion, a drinking 
buddy of the court and court poet of Al Malik al Mansur. But it's important to remember Safiya Dean's main source of income was trade. And as a merchant, he traveled widely, which also meant that a fair number of his praise poems were mailed to their addressees rather than recited in person. It's a very interesting fact. So Safiya Dean's most important travel outside Mardin was his stay at the court of the Mamluk Sultan, An Nasir Muhammad ibn Qalawun in Cairo, following his pilgrimage in 1322. Safiya Dean was introduced to this sultan by the sultan's confidential secretary, Ala ad Din ibn al Athir. And Safiya Dean also met with important scholars like the Sira writer and poet Ibn Sayyid al Nas and the grammarian Abu Hayyan al Gharnati. And after some well received praise poems, the sultan suggested that Safiya Dean gather his poetry together into a thematically arranged diwan, which is what survives today. In 1331, a Safadi met Safiya Dean, a Safadi, a man of letters, we've mentioned in previous episodes. And they met near Aleppo when Safiya Dean was petitioning the governor of Syria, Saif ad Din Tangiz, who was hunting in this area to catch a thief who'd stolen from him in, in Mardin. And then on that occasion, Al Safadi received a comprehensive ijaza from Safiya Dean for all his past and future work and all works that he was permitted to translate. So Safadi is an important name for us to remember in terms of understanding Safiya Dean's own work and also his legacy. Safiya Dean then spent more time in Syria than before going to the Mamluk court at, at Egypt, especially in Hama. And there in Syria, Safiya Dean built a close relationship with Hama's ruler, Al Mu'ayyid Ismail, who was a vassal of the Mamluks in Egypt. Safiya Dean doesn't totally abandon the Artuqats at this point, but when Al Mu'ayyid, the ruler of Hama, dies in 1332, Safiya Dean writes a very moving elegy for him, which, interestingly, is modeled or a creative imitation of the famous Nunia of Ibn Zaydun, whom we discussed two episodes ago. This is an, another example of uh, one of these poems responding and written in the same rhyme and meter as a previous poem. Sometime in the last two decades of his life, Safiya Dean starts spending more and more time in Baghdad, and we can track this with sort of internal evidence from one of his works, Kitab al-Atal al-Hali, which is a study of colloquial forms of poetry common to the Eastern Arab world around this time. Safiya Dean died in Baghdad in kind of obscure circumstances, and it was around 1350. His pre-modern biographers differ on the date by as much as five years. And, you know, given this range, it's entirely possible that the plague that struck Baghdad in 1348 to 1349 could have taken Safiya Dean as well. But he may also have survived as late as 1352. Again, there's some controversy on this point. Safiya Dean al-Hilli's poetic style is described as innovative and experimental. How would you characterize his work? Safiya Dean's major poetic works are two, actually. There's a collection of eulogies, which I mentioned before, Durar and Nahur, Jewels for Necks, and then his Diwan, his arranged by topic. So the Durar and Nahur is a series of 29 odes, each of 29 lines. And each poem is ha- characterized by a letter of the alphabet that serves as both the rhyme letter and the first letter of each line. I'll say that again. Each poem is characterized by a letter of the alphabet that serves both as the rhyme letter and as the first letter of each line. So it's the first and last letter of each line. And the letters include lam alif written together as a single letter preceding ya, but there is no alif maqsura. And in the introduction, Sophia Dean claims that he invented this structural technique, but Ibn al-Arabi used the same organizing principle in a series of 10-line poems in his Diwan. But Al-Halli's work became the model, and uh, it actually served, it initiated a mini-genre of poetry called the Rauda, or Garden. And for more on this mini-genre, readers can, there's a uh, a book by Halush, which I'll, I'll mention a bit later. Safiya Dean was famous as a writer of Qasidas and Muwashahas, and these form his extensive poetic Diwan as we know it today. Among his poems, Specific ones to note, there's a Qasida Sasaniya on the devices of beggars, fraudulent Sufis, and other tricksters, in which he uses a very recondite, difficult vocabulary, in part deriving from 
various dialects of the Iraqi, Syrian, Eastern Anatolian milieu where he worked. And for another type of this poem, you can see Abu Dulef's. And both poems are translated in their entirety, along with a critical edition in Bosworth's book, The Medieval Islamic Underworld. Since then, Ibrahim Hawar, who did the best surviving, did the best critical edition of Safiya Dean's Diwan, edited the Diwan, and including this Sasania poem, which differs quite sharply in some points from Bosworth's reading. So as this brief summary should show, Safiya Dean took an interest in many different forms of poetry, and the topics that are included in his Diwan are fakhr, so um, boasting, and hamasa, bravery, eulogy, praise, and thanksgiving, hunt poems and other descriptive poetry, friendship, which was an important new subject in this age, a relatively new subject for poetry, elegy and, el- uh, and condolence, ghazal and other erotic themes, wine and flower or nature poems, complaints and chiding, aitab, so sort of like gentle chiding from a friend, gifts, apologies, and the request for leniency, riddles and complex ideas, uh, asceticism and other relatable things, and then funny and satirical anecdotes. And as readers, readers of classical Arabic poetry will know, some poets were on the theme of uh, wine drinking and same-sex relations, spoke more boldly than others, and Zalfiya Dean is a prime example of this. As noted above, he has a whole section on wine, which he calls the origin of all pleasure. And in one poem, he urges his listener to commit the loveliest of sins, saying, drink of it, a wine that brings souls together, abolishing their worries, drink sparingly, a little wine refreshes the soul, and too much harms the body. Then repent and ask God's forgiveness. You'll find him merciful. So he further wrote a work in verse on rhetoric that um, seems to have launched a new subgenre of classical Arabic poetry, a mini genre. And this is, of course, the, the Badiriya, or figures poem, rhetorical figures poem. And what it is, is it's a praise poem to the Prophet Muhammad modeled on al Busiri's famous Burda mental ode in which each line also exhibits a particular rhetorical device. So it is on the one hand, a praise poem to the prophet, and on the other hand, like a rhetorical manual. So it's a, in the evaluation of Suzanne Stetkevich, it's a hybrid devotional performance that combines the science of rhetoric, the essential element of the tenet of the miraculousness of the Quran, with the art of praising the prophet Muhammad, reenacting the miracle of the Quran and the blessing of al-Busiri's Borda. And also of interest, as one of the few works of its type deemed worthy of a critical critical edition, a modern critical edition, is Salfiya Dean's treatise on popular Arabic poetry, which I mentioned before, Al-Atal Al-Hali, which illustrates different kinds of colloquial poems or popular, quote-unquote, popular poetry forms of the time with his own compositions and from anthologized works by other authors. And the kinds of poetry included are the Zajal, and actually that takes up most of the, the book, but also the Mawaliya, Kan, Wakan, and the Quma. Call, and as I said, most of the book focuses on the Zajal, which is, of course, the form of oral strophic poetry recited in a colloquial dialect. And uh, aside from these works, we can also mention Adur and Nafis, Fi Ajnas at Tajnis, which is a treatise on one of the poet's favorite figures of speech, Paranomasia, or root play. Al Mizan fi ilm adwar al adwar wal auzan, a treatise on rhythmical cycles and meters in music. Faida fi tawallud al anram, baadiha an baad wa tartibiha al al buruj, an astro musical, uh, sorry, astro astrologico musical treatise, <laughs> which um, which treats connections between notes of the musical scale with the heavenly bodies. And these are just a few of his surviving works. Sophia Dean wrote a lot of very interesting works that still need a lot of work, a lot of study if, uh, if people are interested in a, a fascinating figure from the Mamluk period. Sophia Dean Al-Hill is perhaps best remembered for verses that inspired the pan-Arab colors. White are our deeds, black are our battles, green are our tents, red are our swords. How would you characterize his legacy? Here I'd like to quote Thomas Bauer, who's one of the great living scholars of the Mamluk period of Mamluk Arabic literature. And he wrote this back in 2005. 
We live in hard times for pioneers and discoverers. There are no more blank spots on the map of our globe. There are no undiscovered continents, no unexplored jungles, and no unknown tribes to be found. But there is still Mamluk literature. Despite several remarkable efforts in recent years, the state of the art of Mamluk literature is, in a word, deplorable. There is no comprehensive and reliable overview of the literature as a whole. Many crucial texts still remain unedited, and monographs on Mamluk poets, or the most important genres of Mamluk literature, are lacking almost altogether. Still quoting, he says, It is not easy even today to determine who were the most important literati or even which books were the most characteristic, influential, and important. What we see is an enormous contrast between a flourishing flourishing literary culture on the one hand and a remarkable dearth of scholarly enterprise dealing with that culture on the other. So as I said before, if you are a PhD student and you're interested in Arabic literature and you would like a period of Arabic literature to study which is badly in need of work, the Mamluk era. And it's a fascinating era too, because of these various trends, which I mentioned, including occasionalism, meaning poetry on sort of everyday life and professions and other things like that. And so Sophia Dean is one of those figures who, uh, you know, could stand a lot more uh, scholarship. Khalil ibn Aybek al-Safadi, who I mentioned before, who is Safiya Dean's student, took an ijazah from him, considered Safiya Dean the greatest poet of the age. And apparently this affection was reciprocal. Of course, al-Safadi was biased since he'd taken an ijazah from Safiya Dean, but he probably went to study with Safiya Dean since he liked his work in the first place. Ibn Nubata al-Misri, who Thomas Bauer calls the great poet of the age, knew and had a relationship with Safiya Dean al-Halli and called him the greatest poet of the age. They actually inspired each other to do, to experiment with their poetry. One of Safiya Dean's most important bequests is his Badi'iyya poem, which I mentioned before, in which spawned many creative imitations like one by Ibn Hajja al-Hamawi, who is also the author of a major literary anthology, Khizanat al-Adab. But as time went on, People stopped liking Sophia Dean's poetry. Their enthusiasm for it grew cold. And by the 19th century, he had been sort of cast out of the canon. And one example of this can be seen in the influential Egyptian literary figure, Mahmoud Sami al Baroudi, who doesn't mention a single example from Sophia Dean's poetry in the entire four volumes of his anthology of great medieval Arab poets, Muhtarat al Baroudi, which was also, it's kind of like a syllabus almost of the time for important poets that an educated Arab would need to know about. The Lebanese historical novelist Georgi Zaydan had very little to say about Sophia Dean in Zaydan's History of Literature in the Arabic Language, also another very influential work. In general, Sophia Dean is best remembered for more for his versatility than his originality or the emotional impact of his verse. Whether that's true or not, overall, we should understand that he was important as a transitional figure in the development of Arabic literature. Interestingly, given Sophia Dean's openness about drinking wine and his romantic adventures, one of his legacies has come from the section on his diwan about devotional poetry. Sophia Dean devotes a whole section of his diwan to devotional poem, poems, reminding us that the Badi'iyya wasn't the only, his only composition in this field. And a good example of this kind of religious poetry he'd compose throughout his life is this following short set of verses that he supposedly recited after visiting the Prophet Muhammad's tomb. So he writes, To you, Prophet of a right guidance, anyone who is a friend affiliating himself to your love is led. There he obtains the wage of his his mission and is purified of any terror he has acquired. He resorts to you seeking intercession. To God belong the things he has connection to. Ask God to make a way out for him and provide him from whence he does not reckon. And for further reading, I would recommend um, a few works. Wolfhart Heinrichs has an entry on Sophia Dean al-Halli in Encyclopedia of Islam 2. And uh, Terry DeYoung has a similar sort of overview entry on the poet in Essays in Literary, Arabic Literary Biography 925 to 1350. Selma J.U.C., has talks about him in her chapter from the Cambridge History of Arabic Literature volume on Arabic literature in the post-classical period. I would suggest that listeners read this alongside Thomas Bauer's insightful, if vitriolic, review of that 
volume under the title In Search of Post-Classical Literature. Suzanne Stetkevich has an article called From Jahiliya to Badiria. And then more recently, Ewald Wagner wrote about Safiya Din al-Halli's Muwashah Mudammin, about a Muwashah, a strophic poem by al-Halli that formally expands on a poem by Abu Nawas, a very interesting study. And finally, let's end with a sample and translation. The poem I'd like to read from contrasts with some of these pious poems, which I mentioned just a moment ago. And they, it, it's one of many that emphasize enjoying extramarital love and wine, a subject which one might expect from the boon companion or nadim of a ruler, which was a role that Al-Halli often filled in the course of his career. So a good example is this following poem, which was adapted and sung by the renowned Egyptian recording artist Abdul Wahab in the mid-20th century. And it, in fact, it became a permanent and highly regarded part of his, uh, his musical repertoire. And this is just a, a section. She said, You have shadowed your eyelids with slumber. I said, As a result of wakeful waiting for your beautiful phantom. She said, You have sought to amuse yourself with diversions after our separation. I said, Abandoning my place of rest and peace of mind. She said, You have busied yourself with things other than our love. I said, With an excess of weeping and sadness. She said, You act as though you have forgotten. I said, Give me strength. She said, You have kept your distance. I said, From my homeland. She said, You have absented yourself. I said, Abandoning my ability to endure. She said, You have changed. I said, Only in my body. She said, You have devoted yourself to everything but our friendship. I said, Weak and wayward where you are concerned. She said, You have divulged our secrets. I said to her, Passion for you has made my secret public. She said, You've given gladness to our enemies. I said to her, That is something, had you wished, would never have happened. She said, What do you want? I said to her, A lucky hour spent trysting with you is all I need. She said, The spy's eye is watching us. I said, The evil eye is never far from me. Your aversion to me has made me weak and thin, and if death were not lying in wait for me, you would never have been able to see me. And of course, this last line is a directly inspired by an earlier lyric composed by Al-Mutanabbi, where Al-Mutanabbi describes himself as a long-suffering lover, the dying victim of a cruel, indifferent, and silent beloved. And he describes himself as a man whose body has been starved away. If it were not for the fact that I'm speaking to you now, you would never have been able to see me. Dr. Blankenship, thank you. Thank you, Talha.